Hey there, welcome to open class number 54. Hope you're doing really well. This is sort of a little special, special edition because there was one particular question we, we didn't get to uh, that I know Matthew has been waiting for for a long, for a, quite a while, I should say. And also want to share some other things, a really, really interesting um, message actually from within Bedtime, the app where I coach from Jessica, one of my clients who is, happens to be a psychologist. And she talks about OCD and how you how you move past OCD. It's so similar to insomnia, super, super interesting. And we also have a little success story or maybe budding success story. Maybe, you know, maybe John is already doing great, but I want to share some insights from uh, a member of this community who's 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 done so well, learned a lot here and you know, learned from us, and then we've learned from him, etc. So with that said, let us let me share my screen here and we will get going. And I will, I will continue today to try to uh, infuse this episode with NATO insights, NATO concepts, et cetera. For those of you who knew, by the way, NATO is, stands for non-attachment to the outcome. And it is a philosophy that is born, that was born here on in the sleep coach school. And it sort of takes, you know, the best from CBT, the educational parts, but, mer but, but kind of, you know, blends in a lot of acceptance, ACT stuff and mindfulness and just other things like that. And I think it's become a, a school, if you will, that, that I think will be really helpful for insomnia and beyond. But anyway, with that said, let us take a look at this uh, first um, uh, first part here. This is actually a comment from John. Uh, John, what did he say? It's, there's something more. John, John something. I, I forget the whole thing. Um, this is a comment on open class number 48. Let's read it. I'm sleeping very soundly now, and I think I finally cracked the final piece of the puzzle. And by the way, just I think it is sort of like a puzzle, actually, when you're at least when you're starting your path towards sleeping better, understanding everything is really like a puzzle. Sometimes you understand things like, oh, the fatigue I'm having is not because I sleep a little, because it's because of my struggle. Oh, I I, I can have a good day even if I sleep a little. Oh, you don't have to sleep. Like it's, it's like all those when all those puzzles, you know, or when many of those pieces of the puzzle come together, you really start to see that. Like, like Sasha Stevens said, who was the guest on this problem, she said, there's nothing there. There's actually no problem. There's just, you know, your mind has created this thing that doesn't exist. But anyway, <laughs> quick, quick comment there on the puzzle. Now, I have actually beaten insomnia a month back, but the belief that I still have it can actually bring on the symptoms of insomnia. So I went from suffering from insomnia to paradoxical insomnia by monitoring myself too much. Uh, for those of you not familiar with the paradox on some, it simply means that you're, there's a big discrepancy between how much you actually sleep and how much you believe sleeping. It often uh, feels like you're time traveling, time just skips ahead and you, you feel like I didn't sleep or something like that. Anyway, also I found I understood way more about sleep than before. I find people naturally get very sleepy after being awake for 17 to 18 hours. And this is the so-called sleep drive, which builds from just Staying awake long enough, typically 17, 18 hours of awake time generates about six to seven hours of sleep duration. I also found it is natural to get a bit of wakefulness, sleepiness in each other at any one time. So while asleep, it is natural to momentarily become alert, aka wake up several times during the night and vice versa. When awake, everyone gets sleepy once in a while throughout the day. I guess these are effects of hormones in the human body, depending on which is more dominant. It's kind of like a yin yang thing where there is a tiny black dot in the white environment and likewise a white dot in the black environment. So when I stopped paying attention to my symptoms, I realized I'm now back to my normal self. I'm already a normal sleeper. Wow, exclamation mark. What a revelation. It's actually possible to sleep normally even when thinking about sleep or fearing insomnia as long as those thoughts are being processed like any other. A sleep thought is just like any other. Just a thought. It is no bearing on the ability to sleep because the body will naturally produce sleepiness after the required amount of wakefulness has been achieved. The body will also naturally wake when the required amount of sleep to rest or rejuvenate has been achieved. Absolutely no mystery there. Thank you for answering my questions. I think I'm very less about sleep now because I understand it so much better. This is very, very, very insightful from John. I think the yin and yang thing so true like we normally have some wakefulness in sleep and we normally have sleepiness during the day also definitely the whole thing about sleep drive i think that is generally speaking very true that when we don't struggle with sleep we're awake for about 17 to 18 hours and that kind of generates a need for about six to seven hours of sleep it's sort of something like that but it's also important just just to point out that sleep drive is not what matters when you have trouble sleeping it's not like you need to force yourself to be really sleepy 
it's it's the opposite it's just like john it's just understanding not uh, trying to interfere with it not trying to uh control sleep but rather just delegate it to the body you know not doing anything and then it happens and there was one more thing i thought was really interesting um oh yeah this one i i went from suffering from insomnia to no no uh i, uh, I actually had beaten insomnia I always, I'm all a little bit careful using those words because you, you know, it's really there's no fight, really. There's no opponent. There's no enemy. But by beaten insomnia, I think John just understand it means he understood it, you know. But the belief that I still have it can actually bring on the symptoms of insomnia, which is this is really interesting. It's I, I hear this echoed many times that someone says, I don't think I, I have insomnia anymore. I just have a fear of having it, or something like that. And and then the fear of having insomnia paradoxically can make you have trouble sleeping. So do you then have insomnia? It becomes this kind of mind thing. But um, anyway, when you when you get to a point where you're like, I don't think I have insomnia anymore, but I still am a little bit afraid of having it another time or something like that. That just means that you've taken a big step in the right direction. And uh, like John, you're gonna start sleeping well again. And if you if you worry a little bit about having trouble sleeping in the future, well, that's normal. But when you have understood it one time, I think you truly are immune to it. You will you will still be a little bit afraid. You may have some struggle here and there, but you won't go down the rabbit hole of buying blackout curtains, buying melatonin, trying this and that again. So John, I wanna thank you so much for sharing this. It's super insightful, super helpful. I love the yin yang thing you said there. Okay, so let's move on to the next part here, which we, we're gonna take a look at a, um, this is really, again, a message within bedtime, the app where I coach. And uh, where is it? Uh, here. There there was, maybe that, I think this is, the, is this the first one? There are three, I think this is the first one, yeah. Yeah, here. Uh, this is from Jessica, one of my clients who happens to be a psychologist. A couple of things I thought I might share. The idea that we should really try to accept what we are afraid of is the tenant of exposure and response prevention, which is really effective treating OCD and phobia. The idea of the therapy is to intentionally think about the discomfort and then not allow yourself to do the safety behavior that actually reinforces the worrisome thought. The idea is that worried thoughts are intrusive and alarming, slash uh, in, within parentheses, obsession, they spark anxiety, and then we feel the need to do something to relieve the anxiety, compulsion. So we can spend the whole day worrying about sleep and then do something like research insomnia, get morning sunlight, wear blue light glasses, take melatonin, etc. This is technically compulsions, but by completing those acts of anxiety, decrease, but, by, but by completing those acts, our anxiety decreases, which feels good. But that actually makes the whole process repeat itself. The next time we have that thought, we repeat the behaviors that reduce the anxiety, the anxiety reduces, and now we, we are reinforced for having the thought in the first place. The thought itself eventually leads to anxiety. The thought, it's, uh, the thought itself eventually leads to anxiety reduction. That's called chaining in behavior analysis, if I remember correctly. So the idea behind uh, accept the thought and don't go down the rabbit hole of trying to do things to secure sleep is really very much like an OCD process using EPR as treatment, which is the most effective way to treat it. In fact, having people intentionally expose themselves to the imagined a worst case scenario would be helpful, but they would have to think about these exposures long enough for their anxiety to go to zero or, or one every time they have a spooky sleep thought. If they really jumped into the thought and sat with it long enough, eventually their brain would get bored and the anxiety reduces, they go through a process of hab habituation to the thought itself. This leads to extinction of the stress anxiety tradition associated with sleep. I, when I read this, it, I was so impressed. I was like, this is, this is exactly like insomnia, exactly like insomnia. And just to repeat what I think is the kind of like, it's very similar to panic attacks too, it's very similar to panic attacks. Like a panic attack is like you have some, you think about something that may be, not be obvious to you, but there is a thought that produces some kind of sensation. And then the more you think of this, oh, it's gonna happen, I'm gonna have this panic attack, then it, it becomes generalized. And then you do the safety behavior. You take a medication, you sit down, you hold on to something, you do things to save yourself from this threat, which is actually perceived. And then when you feel better, the anxiety is reduced. You, you feel like, oh, that was good. I'm so happy I sat down because now I escaped that threat, but there wasn't a threat. The safety behavior, however, makes it seem so. Whenever you hide from something, 
you think that there's something to hide from, right? So with OCD, it's like, you know, you have the obsessive thoughts, which is sort of anxiety producing thoughts, and then the compulsion, which is done to escape that feeling of anxiety. But it is the compulsion, the act, the thing you do to escape the anxiety that makes you continue having OCD. Exactly like insomnia. It's like when you try to escape being awake at night, you know, you may do things like like Jessica said here, like take melatonin, wear blue light, which makes you feel a little bit better. It feels like you have some control. But in the long run, is that escaping wakefulness, escaping wakefulness uh, that produces more of it, right? Uh, so super, super um, important, I believe, uh, that knowing that it's all really the same. OCD, panic attacks, anxiety, insomnia, it's all the same. All right, so let's move along here to um, the, main, the main message here we're going to go over. This is from Matthew. Let's read this together. Hi, Daniel. I found your YouTube channel, watched several of your videos, and have ordered your book. Thank you, Matthew. I really appreciate your positive approach and way you talk about this subject. I've been suffering from extremely severe insomnia since August. By extremely severe, I mean that if I do not take Ambien, I do not sleep. When I take Ambien, I only sleep a few crummy hours, generally three to four hours, at most five hours every now and then. Never had a problem with sleep, anxiety, or depression before now. I would like to go over how I got there. Prior to COVID, I was a perfectly healthy, fit person. I had COVID back in May, September. I experienced shortness of breath for these months that did not seem to be getting better. My breathing did finally get better, but not before it was too late for my mental health. The prolonged shortness of breath caused me extreme anxiety and depression that I'm pretty sure is what led me to being not being able to sleep. One night in August... I woke up at 3 a.m. and could not go back to sleep. I thought, this sucks. Then it happened again the next night. Then over the following night, 2 a.m., then 1 a.m., etc. Over about the course of a week or two, I just couldn't sleep anymore. Then I went five days with essentially no sleep and was literally trembling. I called my doctor and he prescribed Lunesta that led me to sleep for four nights. Then it stopped working. He also tried hydroxazine, temazepam that only let me sleep one night and then stopped working. For your information, since my breathing is better, the underlying health, depression, and anxiety is gone, but insomnia remains. Now I get depressed and anxious over sleep. I went through the typical obsessive internet search, functional medicine doctor, visited a hypnotist, etc., and thus became obsessed with sleep hygiene efforts, thinking this would fix my problem. I've since relaxed my focus on these sleep efforts, as you call them, but I'm still working on letting go. I really don't know how to let go any further. Next, I reached out to a sleep psychologist that started me on bedtime restriction. I've been seeing her since for about 15 weeks and keep sleeping sleep journals. I've seen very minimal improvement from her help, and I'm probably about to stop using her as I don't feel I'm getting anything for the large amount of money that I'm paying her. Since uh, she hasn't really helped me with the cognitive part of the therapy, she just focuses on bedtime restriction. Even doing bedtime restriction for a month under her guidance, I was getting such little sleep that I was impacting all parts of my life, including my marriage and work. After a month of seeing no improvement and only sleeping a few hours every other night, my sleep psychologist that normally does not want people to use medications recommended I use a sleep aid jointly with her methods to hopefully build how much sleep I was getting with a plan to wean off as soon, soon as possible. So my doctor prescribed Ambien. I've been taking it every night for two months now. I know it's that's not a good thing, but I don't really feel like I had a choice because I have not been able to fall asleep within that for more than five to ten minutes. The little bit of sleep that I have been getting made my life more enjoyable, but unfortunately... Ambien seems now to be losing its effectiveness, and it's taken me over an hour uh, or two to fall asleep, even with Ambien. I tried not to take Ambien last night for the first time as I'm trying to prepare myself to uh, if it stops working, but I took melatonin and CBD gummies, and I did not sleep at all. I tried getting up and reading. I had a little anxiety towards my bed for a while, but I don't have that anymore. I feel comfortable in my bed. I think the only reason I get anxious towards bed was because my sleep psychologist said that I probably do even if I don't realize that she basically created that thought for me. My problem is that I never get sleepy. I mean, never. I just take Ambien. I'm a sleep time to fall asleep. I read a few books of which I found the most beneficial was Guy Meadows' book. I've read, uh, I really tried to accept my insomnia, but I still obsess over not being able to sleep. So here I'm concerned uh, that what little sleep that I'm getting from Ambien is about to disappear. And I'm going to be back to not sleeping at all. I'm unsure how common my severity of insomnia is for you, but I, I could really use some help to get me on a positive track. Do you see people as severe as me get better? I really hope so. Thank you for any encouragement that you may have. I'm considering buying your app, but would like to know what it has uh, if it has appropriate tools for someone with a severe case as I have. Matthew, I want to thank you so much for um, for sharing this. And I think there's so many important things. Actually, I want to 
immediately here write down what we should talk about today. First, we're going to go over the um, uh, the perceived threat model. Super important. Let me show this to you. That's going to be like our number one thing. And then uh, we are also let's let's show that uh, while we're doing that. We'll create another model. So we, we should also take a look at gas and brake. That's important because we need to understand why you know Ambien sometimes it seemed to help, but then it didn't. Other medications did help also. We have to talk about that. And then uh, lack of uh, we can call we can talk, talk about Houdini effect again. Houdini effect. And because you know Matthew says here that he literally doesn't um, uh, perceive any sleepiness, and what else? Was there anything else I'm missing here that I think is important? Oh yeah, the, the, my case is very severe. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. We should talk about. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We have to talk about implied controllability. Very important, and that's going to see why CBTI didn't work, but it didn't work. And then we're going to talk about the type to concern, which is gonna, which is basically Matthew's concern is like something is really wrong with me. And okay, cool. So what we're gonna talk about in this episode are some really, really key NATO concepts uh, for sure. And Neil is here, <laughs> cool. Every comment that you read just proves that insomnia is not a sleep problem, but anxiety that leads to OCD and leads to more need of control uh, or trying to control sleep, but it, that, it, that is impossible. Yep, absolutely Neil, it's uh, so true and uh, you know, Spinning off of this a little bit, trying to control sleep, that's impossible. It's so important to understand that because so many people are so mad at themselves, angry, frustrated, feel hopeless because they try to sleep and then and then feel that way. But when you know it is impossible, you're literally trying to squeeze water out of a stone. You're literally trying to like, I'm going to make my hair blue. I'm going to make my hair blue. I'm going to make my hair blue. No, my hair is still black. Oh, no. What, what's wrong with me? Like, uh, you know, I don't mean to belittle anyone's problems. Of course not. But I, I want to point out that when you when, when you you're angry at yourself it is because you're trying to do something that like neil says is not possible so why be angry at yourself be kind to yourself and and you'll see good things come your way okay back to this back to our neil, uh, matthew's question so so perceived threat model what does this get to do with what match you went through okay so we're going to take a quick uh, detour into the mind we're going to explore how the mind works actually we're going to start with our bodies Okay, <laughs> let's do it this way today. Take a look at your, like imagine yourself in the mirror and, and uh, or just inspect your body. Like why do you have, um, let's say, why do you have a nose? You know, why do you have uh, knees? Why do you have an elbow? Well, that's, it's pretty obvious, right? We have a nose so we can smell things. We can lead us in the right direction, which is basically helps us survive because we can smell our way to something, you know, that's edible, let's say. Why do we have an elbow? It's it's for mobility, right? So we can reach something or we can fight or something like that. Our bodies are designed to make us survive. Our bodies are sort of a survival machine, right? Ourselves or our species, our kids, etc. How about the brain? Guess what? Same thing with the brain. Every cell in there is there for the purpose of survival, okay? That, by the way, extends to our core emotions. What are our core emotions? What are our five core emotions? We got happiness, sadness, uh, anger, uh, disgust, and uh, fear, of course, right? Those are five core emotions. Why do we have those emotions? Well, it may seem like they're just there to kind of entertain you or annoy you or bug you or whatnot, but that's not the case. They're there for survival too. They have very, very practical, uh, they're, they're, they're very, very practical, okay? Sadness, actually sadness is kind of the, the least in t it's the trickiest one to, to, to see how the practical value, what's the practical value being sad? Well, if you're trying to reach that berry, that's so juicy, juicy berry up there that you see, I wanted that berry, and you're trying to reach it, you jump for it, you stand on a stone, but you just can't reach it. Well, if you stand there all day trying to reach it, that's not good for your survival, right? So you feel sad, like you give up, no point. Like, very practical. Sadness is very practical. Um, happiness is the only kind of like... Um, the rewarding one, like when we band, we meet a lot of friends, right? We feel happy. Why? Because that's good for us. Like we 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 form a social bond. We have people around us that will save us if we're in trouble. So that we're rewarded by happiness. Happiness has a practical, uh, very practical purpose. Sadness does too. And anger, you see, fighting back. All of our emotions are super practical. So when we are faced with 
what are we going to do today? We're going to do a, a rhino today. We're being attacked by a rhino, okay? The rhino's coming at us. The brain is in its zone. It is perfect. And, and that's because it is a survival machine again. And when the rhino comes at us, what emotion do we deploy? Think about it for a second. It's going to be happiness. Is it going to be sadness? Is it going to be disgust? No, it's going to be fear, of course, right? Uh, fear uh, is is the is the emotion that dominates when we're being attacked by a rhino, and that's perfect because either we scare it away, you know, fight, or we uh, we use flight, fight or flight. We we escape, you know. Probably we're going to escape. That's probably the best best uh, best option when we're facing a rhino. But anyway, point is, fear is very practical. It leads us towards survival, and that's what everything is there for. Okay. Now comes the confusion. What is the confusion when you have insomnia? Well, it is that being awake at night is a threat, just like the rhino, okay? To the brain, a threat is always a threat, no matter what it is. If it's a real or perceived one, it doesn't make a difference to the brain because it thinks it's a threat. I mean, I know it's perceived, but the brain doesn't know that. It really, literally thinks that being awake at night is a rhino, so it deploys fear, and then what happens is you cannot you cannot outrun wakefulness. You cannot do that. You can't outrun it. You can't crush it. You can't because it's not tangible. But when you when you try things and it comes keeps coming back, the brain goes like, oh my gosh, this is a bigger threat than I thought. We've got to hit it harder. Okay. So what does this translate to in practical reality? Well, this is uh, the sleep efforts. You know, those are all attempts that's trying to escape, but also the medications, Tamazepam, Ambien, you know, Lunesta, those are all attempts to try to escape the perceived threat of being awake at night. And sometimes when you believe in it, I, you believe in Lunesta, you can find a cave, you know, you believe in it so, so much that it seems like the grizzly bear or the tiger. And <laughs> what are we doing now? A rhino. The rhino is kind of, uh, it, it can't see you or something. You're in the cave, you get the Lunesta, you feel better, you sleep better. But guess what? After some, after a while, you lose faith in it and you feel like, oh no, the rhino is coming at me again. And then you start sleeping very little again. So all those things can seem like they help because they can they can they can lead you to that cave, but you always think that it's a threat out there. They will always quote unquote stop working. So I think that was really really important for uh, in in Matthew's case here, uh, going over that email to see that's why nothing works. It's because nothing actually teaches you that there is no threat. You, your brain still believes that there is a threat out there, and as long as your brain believes that there is a threat out there you'll have trouble sleeping. Let's take a break from, from this for a second and go over to some live comments. And then we're going to go back, of course. Uh, no one ever made himself fall asleep, 100%. So true. Um, or, by the way, or nobody jumped to sleep. <laughs> I say this because Neil made a really good point one time about how we say fall asleep because it's it, it's implied in that, that we fall asleep. It's passive. We can't control it. Nobody jumps to sleep, right? That's a good one, Neil. Thank you for that one. Uh, Moise says, thank you for time. Last class, you talked about not counting hours to sleep. But how about smart devices that measure sleep? There is there a benefit or not? Uh, measuring like deep sleep and sleep in, in general. Uh, I, I don't think there's any benefits. I've, you know, let me put it this way. I think actually there are, is a rare occasion that it may be a little bit helpful. And that is when somebody has this belief that they sleep nothing at all. Let's say somebody says, I literally believe that I don't sleep a minute at all. And, and they also think, they also think that, but if I got some evidence I sleep, I think that would really make me worry less about my sleep. That would really make me feel good. That person maybe can use a tracker actually. They could uh, record uh, with a tracker and they'd see like, oh, I did sleep three hours and I thought I slept none at all. Oh, I think so probably, I think, um, the, you know, I, I just can't estimate so well. Oh, I feel better. Okay, et cetera. For that person, that could be a little bit better. But for like 99.82% of people that have trouble sleeping, um, the, the problem comes from trying to control something that you cannot control, which is sleep. And when you use a tracker, it is a way of sort of trying to have a little bit of control. And, 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 and so it just, it doesn't help at all. Because again, the more you try to control it, the more slippery it becomes. It's like a soap, you know, like a bar of soap. Like the more you try to hold on to it, the more it slips away, right? So a, a tracker is sort of like to try to get a grip of it, you know. Ahmed says, I uh, hope that helped, Modi. 
Amit says, how do I not obsess uh, try to sleep when I haven't slept in three days and I have a 12 hour shift in 12 hours? Please give practical advice. I'm desperate. A hundred percent. This is a common one. And a tricky, it is very tricky, this one, because um, you know you have to work a lot and you know that if you slept more, you would you would feel better and do better at work. But you also know that the more you want to sleep, the, the harder it gets, right? So I think the most practical, uh, the most practical device here is uh, what I call, actually, let's do another banner here. I call this one um, detective work, okay? Detective work. So how can Ahmed use detective work? Well, uh, the, the key here for Ahmed and somebody in Ahmed's situation is to get to a place where you're not so attached to getting a certain amount of sleep where you go to us, if I sleep little, that's okay. And then you don't pressure yourself as much and then you sleep better. So how can you do that when you are in this situation? Well, you can do detective work. You can look back and see like, can I find in my memory a time where I slept very little and I still did okay at work? Can I find that? And you scan your memory and you can only find this one clue, this one little fingerprint, this one, you know, one indicator, one thing, one time where you did okay, even if you slept little. And that's enough because that is that is the evidence you need that I can do okay, even if I sleep very little. That can truly take the pressure off. And you can do the opposite too. You can also look for times where you slept quite a bit, but you didn't do good at work. So you're like, oh, anything that makes you see that not everything depends on sleep, that will take the pressure off. Hard as it is, that's, uh, I think, the best and practical advice I hear. All right, now, going back to Matthew, uh, uh, I think one of the confusions here uh, is is kind of like, the, there was a lot of talk about, you know, medications and, and, and what, you know, a lot of thoughts about should I take this Ambien? Now I'm back on Ambien. It didn't work. It only worked for a little time, etc. It's it's good to understand sleep. So the, the, sleep is actually regulated in a very straightforward way. Uh, there's a gas pedal, uh, which is basically what we call sleep drive, uh, the body's need for sleep, and then we have a break, which is hyper arousal, which is when when the, the when the mind is in this more alert state, uh, or you know. And so uh, when we're awake, we are the body with more and more awake, wakefulness, the body need, build, builds some stronger and stronger need for sleep. And eventually we start feeling sleepy. Uh, you may not experience, and, and we'll, do we get to this here? Yeah, Houdini effect. We're going to get to Houdini effect. We're going to get to Houdini effect in a second. And this is why sometimes like Matthew, you don't even experience sleepiness. But for the sake of gas and brake model, uh, sleep drive is the gas. And then we have a break, which is hyper arousal. And nothing else really matters. Uh, so if somebody is not sleepy, um, or, or no, 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 let me put it this way. If somebody does not have any sleep drive, their body literally does not need any sleep at that time. And they're also not hyper aroused. They feel, you know, chillaxed. Then uh, if they go to bed at that time, they will just rest uh, in a pleasant way. They will not sleep, but they will rest. You know, if somebody is, n does not have any sleep drive, uh, their body is not in need of any sleep, but they're hyper aroused, they're kind of anxious or stressed, etc., and they go to bed, that will be very unpleasant. They will not sleep and they will feel, they will feel very uncomfortable because of those, like the, the stress, anxiety, etc. And then we have, so these are, we're going to go over actually four scenarios with sleep drive and like gas and break here. So if you have, we've, we've talked about no gas, no break. We've talked about no gas, yes, break. Let's go over uh, yes, gas, yes, break. So let's say your body does need sleep. There's uh, some need for sleep, but you're also hyper aroused and you go to bed. This is typical in some, this is kind of like, imagine driving a car with both the gas and brake in at the same time. It's like fitful. I slept a little bit, woke up, was hyper, was hyper aroused, was nervous, fell back asleep, etc. cetera. The struggle, the struggle comes from there. And then we have where you want to be, which is, you know, you have sleep drive, but no hyper arousal. That's when you sleep really well. And, uh, you know, the reason I'm spending some time here is to say that, as you can see, medications really don't have a role here because medications cannot make you have more sleep drive. Nothing can make you more sleepy except wakefulness. And medications cannot really take away hyper arousal because that anxiety, for example, comes from a thought, a thought like uh, something's wrong with my sleep system or I can't sleep or something's wrong with me. That those thoughts are always what produces emotions. Emotions come from thoughts. So so medications, you can see, you, you can't take a pill that can change your thought so that you feel in a different way. And medications are very blunt. What they can do is sedate. So 
uh, when you take something like a temazepam, which is a, has a general sedating effect, what they can do, because remember, you have to change thoughts to change emotions. What they can do is that they can make it very difficult for the brain to string together a complex thought. So alcohol, for example, or temazepam or something can make you so sedated that the brain is so dysfunctional that it cannot really produce anxiety producing thoughts. And then you, you don't experience anxiety that hyper, hyper arousal is, is, is gone and then you sleep. In this scenario, using the gas and brake model, you've, you've disabled the brake, you know? The brake is gone, so you may sleep. But that rarely lasts for a long time because you can't really achieve that amount of sedation for, you know, forever. You can't be in this kind of super sedated state every, every night, you know? So that's why medications eventually stop, uh, quote unquote, working because you kind of see through them. You realize that they're not doing anything. Your thoughts go back to, there's something wrong with me, I can't sleep, etc. Now, um, so, and medications can also change your, uh, you, so medications can disable the break. They can also r reduce hyperosal, reduce breaking action if you believe in them. If you take something like, I really believe this is gonna help, then you change your thoughts, which changes your emotions, and then the gas can kick in, right? But uh, I just wanna point out, there's no mystery when somebody says, I've taken this medication and nothing happens. That's because your thoughts haven't changed, you know? So thoughts are, are everything really. All right, now let's move over to Houdini effect. So um, um, uh, Matthew says here that sometimes uh, he, he doesn't experience any sleep. He doesn't literally do not feel sleepy at all. That can be very, very alarming. It can seem like my body is just not producing any sleepiness. That is strange. But the Houdini effect where, where you don't experience any sleepiness. And by the way, the Houdini effect, I typically, it's, it's actually when you, are, you feel really sleepy at bedtime, then you go to bed and you, your sleepiness vanishes. That's the Houdini effect. But that can be sort of a, a Houdini, if not effect, like a Houdini phenomenon is called where that happens over, over days or weeks. Like I don't feel sleepiness for, I haven't felt sleepy for two months. Well, that simply means that you have a break, you have a hyper arousal going, nothing strange with that. And now uh, Matthew mentioned that he had been seeing a sleep, sleep psychologist, they were doing bedtime restriction, which, which is where you purposely spend less time in bed. So you build sleep drive that kind of overpowers the, 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 the break action. And, and the problem here is implied controllability. There's, with traditional cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, there is, uh, it's implied that if you spend less time in bed and you try to reassociate the bed with sleep, then you can control sleep. I Meaning you can get some, some control there, you can produce sleep, you can, and then you can change that bedtime restriction thing and blah, 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 which is very problematic because the whole reason you have insomnia is that you're trying to control something you cannot control. So there's nothing strange with the fact that you've done several weeks of bedtime restriction and it didn't help. In fact, it probably makes things worse because the more you try to control sleep, the, the less you sleep, right? So the final thing I wanna go over here is what we call the type two concern. I think it is a super important concept. And in fact, in my book, which I'm, I'm basically done with the manuscript, I, I am gonna add two more things. I always add more things. Uh, I try to keep it brief, but I want to add actually one concept called con controllability, which is what we talked about here. You can't control sleep and sleep, a sleep detox, which I want to talk about. I want to add that, but I'm just saying that the, the book is done, but I, I have to, I've actually um, mentioned the type two concern twice in the book. I go over the two type two concern twice in the book because I think it's so important. What is the type two concern? Well, Remember that the boy who cried wolf, you know, the story about the boy who cried wolf just because he was bored and the villagers twice came to rescue him, but there was no wolf, right? That's the type one error uh, the villagers committed. They thought there was a problem, but there wasn't, okay? The third time the boy cries wolf, they don't come and he gets eaten by the wolf. Now the villagers committed a type two error, okay? They did not believe there was a problem, but there was, okay? So insomnia is a type one error. It is believing that there's a problem, but there isn't. But the brain, the safety machine it is, and that's why we started this broadcast, remember? We talked about how the brain is a survival machine. The brain, in its attempts to keep you safe and sound and, and alive, it does not want to commit a type two error. It does not want to leave you being eaten by a wolf, you know? So therefore, it wants you to keep your eyes on the ball, the problem, see that there is a problem, right? So that's why we always have these thoughts like, my case is different. Um, uh, there's really something wrong with me. You know, and you see other people have done well, 
but it's different with me. Yes, but this is different. You know, things have changed. It used to be like this, now it's like that. And that is a type two concern. Your brain is concerned about committing a type two error. And so when, when Matthew says, but my insomnia case is so severe, I have so severe insomnia, that's the type two concern. It's like basically the brain is trying to say, yeah, yeah, you know, better time, that might work for other people, but not for you, the brain's saying, because you have really severe insomnia. It's, it doesn't want to commit that type two error. It doesn't want to miss something, some underlying a real problem or something like that. Uh, so that's why you so often have that type of uh, thought, if you will, Matthew. So I hope this was really helpful to you, Matthew, and any, anybody else that tuned in. And, um, you know, if you want to work with bedtime, that's great. Or you can just leave comments here uh, and and, follow, and and study study my book and study the channel. I think you'll do really well. Okay, Amma said, I really appreciate what you do. Watching your videos takes away sleep anxiety, all but temporarily. <laughs> yes, you know, and, and staying on that one, Ahmed, I think, it, you know, initially you may just listen to a video and then you sort of use it in a way as a, as a kind of like to feel good. Like I listened to Daniel, oh, I, there's no problem. I know I feel good. But you may not have completely uh, internalized the teaching and contextualized it, et cetera. When you do, uh, I, I think it will it will help you for longer stretches of time, Ahmed. Um, Neil says, one thing I learned meditating is that you can spend time not being attached to your thoughts and be present. Understand that even though you cannot control your thoughts, you can control the quality of your thoughts. Hope it makes sense. Meaning observe your thoughts rather than identifying with them. I think this is so important, super important. Thanks for sharing, Neil. And um, you cannot control your thoughts, but... I think another thing that I'm sure you, you probably experienced too, Neil, and I, I personally started my own meditation practice, is that when you simply by paying attention to your thoughts, simply by being aware of them, um, you know, the, the, the quality changes in it, or not the quality, maybe the, you, you experience less kind of like uh, thoughts in general. It, it is sort of like as a side effect of meditating, you do have a more quiet mind, but it's not an active it's not an, you don't not doing anything actively. You're just spending time listening to your brain, observing your thoughts. And then, and then you, it just leads towards a place where things are much more calm and peaceful and in, inside you. All right. Perfect. Well, I hope this was helpful to anyone that tuned in. Um, look forward to uh, having you back next week. And until then, take it easy. And by the way, if you uh, would like, if you like kind of the teaching here, the NATO teaching, and you want more of that, then she got our self-coaching master program on our website. That's a video-based course where uh, we do a one week weekly drop-in with either me or Coach Michael. We have a Slack channel as well. And then we have Bedtime also, very convenient. It's just an app where, where I coach. Uh, so anyone who wants a little bit more support, check those out. And that, that's it again. Have a nice rest of your weekend, and I'll be back soon. Bye-bye.